pretty much you know um you hear people who are like passionate about their particular sport and they only want to be professionals in that sport I was the opposite to that On this episode of Chatting with Champions, we speak to Maeve Ploof, who's gone to the Olympics as a member of the track endurance cycling team as the youngest Australian female track cyclist. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Maeve. We're, we're yeah, speaking, thank you so much for having me. No problem. We're speaking to you from Brisbane at the moment, getting getting some preparations in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're here in Brisbane doing our training camp. Um, it's the last camp in the lead up to the games. Usually we'd be international so in America or somewhere else with a bit of altitude for this final prep. Um, but Brisbane is actually a good compromise with COVID and everything that's going on. Um, we're obviously in the same time zone as Tokyo. The climate's pretty similar. And back here is really fast. So it's, it's a good place to prepare, definitely. Wow. Are you, you're, you're, are you from Brisbane? No, I'm Adelaide girl. So okay. Adelaide okay. at the moment is very cold. So I'm very glad I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm here complaining about Brisbane too. So We, we do have the more We do have the perfect weather. Yeah, we got we got it great is very winters. Nice. We got good winters. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we we were chatting to some boxers, Olympic boxers, and they were saying they're uh, in Colorado at the moment, and and they're training it as well with the uh, just I guess the altitude as well helping them out. So uh, I guess the, I don't know, Col- Colorado or Brisbane. I would have chose Colorado, but I guess it's something's yeah. better than nothing anyway. <laughs> Yeah, no altitude here in Brisbane, yeah. but we are going to do some heat acclimation. So um, that's going to be a big part of our training moving forward. So, yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, oh, that's, <laughs> that's really good. So the whole team at the moment you've got in Brisbane, you're all together? Yeah, so we've got the whole um, track team here. So that is track sprint and track endurance. So I have five other girls or four other girls on my team um, and we're part of the women's team pursuit team. Awesome. That's that's. Really awesome. How is it competing as a team? It's a really interesting event, actually, because, you know, you get a lot of endurance sports where, like swimming, for example, relays or athletics or relays, where you do your own individual part and then you just pass on to the next person. And you don't really, you affect the overall time, but you don't necessarily directly affect the person who you're passing on to. Whereas team pursuit, we're actually all staggered in a line and the, whatever the person on the front does, or even the person second and third wheel, it has a massive impact on everyone else behind. So it's like all of our training sessions, everything we do is all in unison. Like we have to be so dialed in with one another. We have to be so in sync. <laughs> um, and we all have to pretty much have the exact same like ability to put out power. Um, we each have our own little niches on the team, like things that we're good at and things that we can rely on each other to do. Um, but as a whole, we, yeah, it's, it's about coming together and getting the whole block of us together at the fastest over the line. Do you guys, do you guys race in, uh, in different spots or you always, for example, you know, oh, I always race in fourth position, Luke races in third and Dino's in second. And like, do you have particular yeah. spots? Yeah, so that's really interesting. Um, traditionally, you would always have your spot. Um, and there are some spots which are kind of more niche than others. So first wheel, for example, coming out of that gate is typically a very niche spot. You usually have someone who's quite strong and sprinty that will come out the gate and do that role. And same as second wheel. Second wheel's physically really hard because you have to go out with first wheel and then do a turn and then sit in and recover while third and fourth who've just had a nice fun ride go and then you got to get the front again so those two are usually typically niche um and third and fourth are a bit more interchangeable um but our team is really flexible um all the women on our team are actually good at riding every single role but that being said we do have some (laughs) yeah (laughs) um so we we tend to kind of um we do have some roles that we're looking forward to for the games. So I'm typically in a second world position, um, but tactically we can move around a lot and we are very flexible, which is a strength of ours. Yeah. When, When you say it's like a niche position, does that mean people get selected based on their ability in that niche or it's the best, the best, and then who fits into that, that first wheel, 
uh, sorry, second wheel and then out of the gate position? Yeah, um, it's a bit of both. So you won't get selected necessarily as, say, a second wheel rider. But if there are three first wheel riders on the team, then that's not needed. So <laughs> you've got to be able to do more than one wheel, I'd say. And then the best person for that wheel will ride the initial wheel and then we'll move forward like that. So you're the second wheel. How are you training specifically for that second wheel then? To be honest, the key is really just riding that second wheel in the sessions. So when we all line up, I'll just make sure I'm always in that second wheel position. Um, most of the training is pretty similar. It's more the physiology that you already have that dictates what wheel you'll sort of ride and, and how well you're going and things like that. Um, so, for example, we've got some girls on the team who are quite good road cyclists and they're kind of more suited to fourth wheel, which is that long, slow, but well, slow, it's still very fast, <laughs> that, that sort of longer burn. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, as opposed to someone coming out the gate who might have a bit more, um, a bit more of a sprint to them. Yeah, is that that first gate? Is that something that's almost partially a genetic thing where you've just got to be able to produce an insane amount of power? Or is it something that, yeah. that you can develop? It's definitely trained. Um, I think that initial real fast twitch is somewhat genetic, but of course you can train a sprint. It's being able to do that sprint and then keep going. That's the yeah. bit, that's the hard training. Yeah, especially on the big gears that we're riding. We're putting on uh, like 110 to 115 inch gears now, which was unheard of a few years ago. Yeah, they're big. Wow. Holy <laughs> so, yeah. That's insane. I mean, yeah, you, you probably understand better yeah, than I, I do. Just I ride a fair bit. Um, you, is the whole yeah, team cool. riding Argon 18s or? Yep, yep. We're on Argons. We've kind of got these like customized. So we've got the Argons and then all the headset and everything is all customized. It's, it's quite cool. They are very beautiful bikes. Wow. There's a lot of tech that goes into it. I think that um, yeah. for the average onlooker, it's like, oh, fantastic. Five girls go round and round and round the circle while riding bikes. But it is an extremely complex machine and the sport and tactics are also really in-depth. Um, you said that you guys have to be really dialed in. Who's sort of leading that? Do you have like a team captain or is it your coach that's um, sort of leading the charge with that? Who dials the team? Well, the interesting thing is compared to a team sport is you can't really communicate while you're out there. Um, so it is a lot of knowing the person in front, knowing their body language. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's a team leader, but when we come so in our sessions, we will do an effort and then we all cool down and we come in and we'll have like a debrief pretty much of every single ride we do. So we will have the splits. So like the laps that we've all done, how fast we've gone in each lap, we'll have a video we'll have everyone's feelings and we'll literally go around. And so like a five minute effort, we might debrief for half an hour. <laughs> so we're at the track all day, yeah. <laughs> just deliberating the little things. Um, we have a physicist employed full time to look at just our aerodynamics in each set. Um, that's a really massive part. Um, we'll be tweaking like tiny little things on the skin suit to make sure we're going as fast as possible. Um, those sorts of things I really took for granted when I was sort of riding amateurly, but now it's those are make or break, like the wow. length of your socks or like how tilted your helmet is. It's so it's almost annoying how precise it needs to be. But <laughs> is, is it is it just those two things that the physicist is looking at, or is there? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, there's a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah like different what, 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 what else? Like, and... What else are they looking at? Uh, well, there's obviously the whole structure of your bike to begin with. So every component on your bike needs to pretty much be perfect. And so they do a lot of wind tunnel testing behind the scenes and things like that. Then once you actually get onto the bike, um, we'll fit the, we fit the bike to each of us. So we'll spend hours out at the track, like testing our seat up by this much or down by this much or testing long cranks or short cranks or long bars or short bars. Like, And sometimes it's like literally like this much difference, um, but that could be a second in a race. Um, and then once you've got the bike fitted, then you have to get your skin suit done. So we've been customizing our skin suits lately and there's all sorts of technology with fabrics and stuff now with that. Um, and then your body position. So I've had to train to basically ride without being able to see anything. Oh. So at this current point, I <laughs> cannot really see in the race. And how fast, um, how fast so, do you reckon you're going without being able to see where, you, where you're going? 
60 ish. <laughs> wow. <That's laughs> um, not- so, and you're like this far from the wheel. So it's just like, dear God. <laughs> um, no, but it is a, it is a skill and it's something that we've had to slowly learn. And um, I haven't actually really been able to post any videos of my current setup or photos on Instagram. Like you might not have, like, we can't even really show anyone because it's a bit hush hush now, but Ooh. I can't wait for everyone to see that at the Olympics, what we look like. We're looking good. good. <laughs> it's, like, it's like with the sailing boats, but they can't reveal the boats until like the America's Cup and then it's yeah. fine. everyone's in the water. Everyone yeah. comes together for it. Um, that, that's really yeah. cool. But yeah, totally. Not being able to see. Yeah, not being able to see because yeah. you're, well, you you're can, right you can see a little someone. bit. Like yeah, how, about, how much see, is a little bit? I can see through their bottom bracket, like so through the wheel a little bit. Like, I can see their cars. <laughs> that is terrible. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I'll be in efforts, and I'm actually like, if I'm tired or I'm not sure, uh, like I will actually not be able to figure out which teammate I'm on. I'll be like, who was in front of me right now? And I'm like trying to tell by the calves. And I'm like, I think it's Georgia, but it might be Ash. <laughs> you, guys, you know what you guys need? You guys need tattoos on your calves so you can see what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Just initials. Something, yeah. something unique. It doesn't wow. help that we're all, yeah, it doesn't help that we're all this pretty much the same size and same weight as well. <laughs> Holy dooly. How do, you, how do you get used to that? Like just, and not crash, I guess. Um probably part of it it's yeah well it's definitely it's taken years I'd say um and the aerodynamics has only been a very recent thing that's been something that became we realized is a massive gain area only in the last year or two or I only realized in the last year but probably the last two to three so since the last olympics um and I guess it's just slowly like we would do rollers, practicing putting our head down. We'd just do, and then we'd implement that on the track slowly. So we were always very good at riding real close behind everyone. So that skill we'd already developed as juniors and, and young riders. Uh, it's just been slowly sinking your head lower and lower and lower. And so you wow. see the progression month after month after month. Um, and we just track that like you do with, with your times or your power or your lifts in the gym. You track your arrow, same like that. Yeah, wow. That's incredible. And and going back to going back to before cycling, you're a swimmer. Is that, is that yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I did um open water swimming and a bit of surf life saving. Um, I did other sports as well, but those two were probably my favourite. And I was my school was visited by the Sassy Talent Identification Program. Um, they did a couple of tests, including like a beep test, fitness test, other things like that. I was hoping to get into something like rowing because I thought that would be cool. But instead I got a letter saying that I'd be a good cyclist. And I was like, I don't want to do that. That's not a sport. (laughs) I was like, no way. I'm not riding a bike. I don't even like riding a bike. And um, anyway, so I was like, well, I may as well go. Like, because not many kids got picked. So I was like, all right, I'll go try it out. And they put me on a track bike and I was like, oh, this is not like my huffy mountain bike. This is different. Like this is, this is a nice bike. And, um, and I loved it. I was, yeah, I was awful, but I liked it. Um, so yeah, I, I did a little bit of triathlon sort of rode once or twice a week for a bit because it's, there's it's still like quite a lot of barriers to get into it. Um, especially if your family don't cycle, it's, it's, there's a lot of things to learn about the bikes and the equipment and where to ride on the road. And, and it's just, it's, it is a difficult sport to get into. So I didn't fully dive into it straight away, but over the next few years, I I kind of did more and more races and and things like that. And then um, once I made my first state team, when I was about 15, I got a sassy scholarship from that. And then they were pretty much said, like, you've, if you want, you've got focus really on cycling if you want to keep the scholarship. So, yeah, that's how that started. Wow. that's really it, cool. it's, really, it's really funny that you, you mentioned the mountain biking because that was something I was going to bring up. So I really like doing uh, bike packing and things like that, a, a little bit more oh, yeah. the, um, medium pace, extreme distance, you know, like trying to do yeah. 100 to 140K a day uh, camp and keep yeah. going. Um, you put up some mountain biking pictures. What is your, uh, besides track, of course, what's your next sort of profession in the cycling world that you enjoy? Um, definitely road. Um, that's, to be honest, 
I was actually better at road before I was at track, um, but track seemed to sort of the pathways I opened up a bit easier just because of the Olympic pathway. Um, but I do ride on the road. I've got a uh, NRS team pro racing Sunshine Coast who I ride with, who are based on the sunny coast. Even though I'm from Adelaide, um, I still get up and race with them as much as I can. And I would love to row after. Um, but I did buy a mountain bike last year and I'm pretty bad at it, but I love it. It's so fun. <laughs> I haven't been riding as much as I want to on the mountain bike because I'm a little bit scared that I'll break something before the Olympics. But after the Olympics, I will be on my mountain bike more, getting better skills. Um, I, did a, I did a bit of a mountain bike sort of a couple of days in the Flinders Ranges actually and if you like bikepacking I would definitely recommend that that was well, so cool I was going to say to you if you really want to get into your mountain biking you should have a look at the Hunt 1000 it's a race held down Ooh. in Victoria uh, it's basically a three to six day race um, with mountain bikes gravel bikes and it's over all terrain it's really hectic it's actually probably listed as one of the hardest endurance uh, bike packing races, but you know what? <laughs> no, but it's, it's not. You know, it's not like you're downhill Danny Hart sort of yes. in the mud downhill yes. racing, but it's still very yeah. fun. It's saying that you might be interested yeah. even just to watch. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. The the thing that's lacking in my mountain biking isn't necessarily the endurance; it's the skills. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I get to like a rock, and I'm like. No, I will. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, um, no, it just the skills at this point. So that that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, quite bad on a bike. Also, I think the last time <laughs> I was no, the last time I was on a bike, I concussed myself, and I don't even know how. Like, oh no! <laughs> I actually don't know how. <laughs> Training wheels on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't remember because you concussed was, yourself probably. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's exactly right. It was it was so bad because I was in I think year year nine and it was it was yeah it was like oh, get us on a bike. <laughs> yeah. and uh it was the day of uh states for cross country and and going into the race i was sort of a, a favorite to win the race um and i, I don't want to sound cocky but but after that uh, i don't really remember it that well <laughs> i remember the last part of the race and just how foggy i was um, which I sort of never was, and I was sleeping before the race, like all these just weird things that I would never be doing, uh, I was doing. And since then, I've never, never rode on a bike. <laughs> that tends to happen when you're concussed, <laughs> Pardon? That tends to happen when you've been concussed. Yeah. Start falling asleep. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, but, but you must have been like super set on, by the sounds of it, going professional or at least competing at a high level in some sport, uh, whether it was swimming or rowing or cycling, were you sort of just looking for something to compete in? Pretty much. You know, <laughs> um, you hear people who are, like, passionate about their particular sport and they only want to be professionals in that sport. I was the opposite to that, to be honest. I just love sport. I especially loved endurance sport. I loved timed events in particular because I just, like, love that pain, love that um, pushing yourself to the next level, striving for those personal bests. Um, I was a bit crazy when I was a young kid. I'm not sure what my parents thought, but I remember I used to wake up at like four in the morning so that I could get to swimming training at 4.30 so I could do half an hour gym before going to, into the pool at five. Then I'd swim till seven, get out, go to school, train in the afternoon, like either on my surf life saving board or like go for a run or I did all sorts of sports. Um, and this is when I was like 11 or 12 and I used to do the 10 kilometer marathon swim. And then I remember I used to get a day off of swimming. And so I'd go run instead and I'd time myself over like, to, like I'd run to the end of the, to the beach or something, which is not that far. And then I'd time myself running back or, and yeah, I'd put a like a little graph on my, I had like a little sp spreadsheet, like a chart, I guess. And that, that I m wrote and I put it on my wall and, I would write in my times that I did to like see if I was getting better. <laughs> and I was insane. so young. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, <laughs> I was always very like strict, very driven, wanted to be a professional athlete. Um, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't sure what sport and I was open to different sports, but definitely was always an endurance athlete. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, that's unreal. I love very that. Very methodical. <laughs> yeah. 
goal driven. Yeah, it was a bit terrifying yeah. to be honest. I look back on that and I'm like, I think if my kids did that, I'd be a bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> would, would, would you? I don't know if you want kids. Would you want kids? I was gonna say, would um, you encourage yeah, yeah, them eventually. to go down the cycling path? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> the thing about cycling, the thing about cycling is it's it, it's really good. But I'm glad I did other sports before I did cycling because it definitely teaches you a good work ethic, things like swimming and surf life saving, stuff like that. Um, I think the great thing that my parents did for me is they never pushed me into any sport. They actually had a rule that I wasn't allowed to go training in the morning unless I woke them up to go training. So it had to come from me if I wanted to go. Wow. And um, cycling was tough because it was expensive. And that is one thing about cycling is that it's expensive to get into. So I was very lucky that Sassy gave me my first bike and they gave me support financially, things like that. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's that was the good thing about my parents is that, you know, we and we sort of had a rule when it came to, to bikes and stuff like that, that they would buy me the base level of everything. So like, the lowest like if I wanted if I needed shoes to ride in they would help me out with like the base level shoe and then anything that I wanted on top of that like if I wanted ones that were like carbon or, or something better or just even ones that weren't velcro I had to pay for the additional on top of that so that was good because I was never riding good bikes like I rode my first tour down under on training wheels like like alloy <laughs> um but i guess it's good when you make your first teams and stuff and you start getting given that stuff because the improvement just goes like that um yeah. i definitely see a lot of kids nowadays on like these like super expensive carbon fiber bikes and things and it's just it's not necessary you know and i think appreciation as well you i mean just by appreciating what you've been given it and working for it as well otherwise it, you just don't get it. Like, That's my, my, yeah, my brother is uh, a very good cricketer, but um, but a lot of his mates have all the stuff paid for, and it's hard because similar hmm. with cycling and any sport where you don't have enough time to work if you really want to put all your eggs in one basket. So they've got all their parents sort of just paying for everything top of the line, but um, hmm. but he's had to sort of just do coaching and stuff like that because otherwise you don't yeah. really appreciate what you're working for as working towards as well. Okay. That's a exactly. Really cool and it is hard. Yeah. And it is hard when you're studying and trying to train and things like that. I was very fortunate like um, that I could live at home and things like that because it is hard when you don't have time to study work and train. Like, so I could only work a, a small amount of time, definitely not enough to, buy the bikes and, and things I needed um, I was lucky by that time that I was on the full scholarship with the Australian team but you know not everyone's that fortunate everyone has different trajectories so they still might be funding everything themselves when they're 20 21 22 um, so yeah I, I am very fortunate that I've been looked after by the Australian team since then as well 100%. and so yeah. well I was gonna I was gonna delve back into the the younger kids getting a little bit more funding and support we're sitting here, and it, it, I'm just playing the devil's advocate, so excuse me. Uh, it's all well and good for us to sit here and go, oh, you know, we're a bit more grateful for coming up with less and, and you know, now being given these awesome opportunities. Do you not think that it would be, it's really awesome that these younger kids are being given these high-end bikes because they're then able to push their dreams and their goals sooner and faster? And, and we're bringing up, I guess, a younger more professional scene in the writing like especially women's writing as well like what's your take on that yeah I definitely think I I'm very excited to see a lot more young girls coming up that's something that I've been so excited to see especially when I go out to local races and you know we've got five or ten uh, like under 15 girls that's really cool um I think the main thing is I'm really excited to see them all on road bikes and things like that like a couple of times like I've gone to the track and a dad's like seen my bike uh, I used to ride I remember it was when I used to ride a Cervelo I had a Cervelo R3 um I'm not sure if you know that much about bikes and this dad came up to me and was like oh how do you like the R3 because I'm thinking about buying my 11 year old daughter the R5 and I was oh, like God. that's like a ten thousand dollar bike so I think I'm really excited to see them all on road bikes and things like that because you know just building those skills and and 
also girls just wanting bikes like yes that's so cool I think it's more just like that you don't need the carbon with the electronic gearing and this and that because you just don't want the divide between the kids who do have it and don't have it um they used to have a rule I think it's still in play when I was a junior that you couldn't ride carbon wheels at racing because it's just a bit unfair for the kids that didn't have carbon wheels and yeah, things like that advantage. I think it makes yeah I think I think you've got to build the skills and like the skills and the work ethic and those things first like that's the core and then you slowly build on top of things those things and that all come with time as you progress with the sport so you think maybe to have because obviously the machine is the determining factor in a lot of aspects of cycling do you think it's really important that especially for the younger younger girls that I guess the sport and the directors board, they really push equality in terms of the machine in order to allow younger female athletes to perform at their peak, I guess. I think it'll never quite be fair. I think there's always going to be, you know, the advantage and disadvantage. And the thing about cycling, it is it is quite high socioeconomic, like just the type of people get into it. Um, so that that is one aspect of it. But I definitely think that, um, I guess there just needs to be acceptance of, you know, everyone, even if there's kids rocking up to crits on hybrid mountain bikes. Like if they want to have a go, they should be able to have a go sort of thing. And I, and I think we're seeing that more and more. Um, definitely just um, – and even track events now, you know, you can hire a, 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 a track bike for $25 a night and that's great for kids who want to get involved. So I definitely think we just sort of need more programs where – they can lend out the bikes or or just get that little extra support because not everyone has a couple of grand to fork out on a, a road bike or a track bike when they're first starting out. So that's really awesome. Have you seen uh, through the $25 a night sort of rent a bike programs, more people coming into the sport? Is, is that helping to grow yeah. the sport? Yeah, we do it in Adelaide on a Friday night. There's a novice session and you, yeah, you can hire the bike out for $25. And I think it's, it's not just for the kids. It's also you get adults coming out. Um, in fact, last year um, I had a couple of my friends who are all from Surf Life Saving and they kept saying to me, like, especially when I made the team, the Olympic team, they were like, oh, we want to try track bikes. We want to try track bikes. And I was like, I thought all these boys were just joking. I was like, oh, yeah, that'll be fun. And, no, they were dead serious. And they came out to this novice session. There was, like, eight of them all got on these track bikes and, like, all swimmers and surf life savings and stuff. So they're not used to riding bikes. And, and they fully got on the track. And now they – I reckon they have a full appreciation for it. And it was, like, a fun night, like, just for – like us adults we're all like between 20 and 30 years old and we're all like out on the track bikes on a friday night it, like what? it's fun I've so, um, that experience. <laughs> there's a exactly um... it's um so you guys so oh yeah yeah no i was just saying exactly why can't they experience it so it's like mm. the 25 dollars a night sort of thing it gets the kids into it but it also just gets people who might have watched it on tv and seen the slanting boards and being like oh I want to have a go at that and then they can actually go out and have a go <laughs> it's so interesting so I sometimes compete in local races there's a there's a fixed fixed geared community over in West End Brisbane uh we ride track bikes and like homemade crap built fixies um I mean hell I've got like I've got a fair few bikes I'm the n plus one kind of guy uh, n being the number <laughs> of bikes I have and it's endless um, and so I've got a, I've got some nice, uh, nice track bikes, but I've also got this shit fifty dollar like free parts fixie. And it's really funny. We go to these uh, fixie and track events, and we ride through the city. We do stupid stuff, and there's people who are riding, as I said, like my fifty dollar free bike, all the way up to like a five hundred dollar, thousand dollar track bike. So no, it is cool because it's not necessarily just like a little kid's sport. There are plenty of adults out there who can you can get around it in yeah. all the different forms. Yeah, it is It is a lot of fun. And, you know, especially on the velodrome itself with the, with the banks, it's cool just to go out and say you've tried. 100%. Going back to um to your current situation with the whole the Australian team, are there any activities that you're doing outside of training together or, or studying for the Olympics to help build comfort or around each other like is there any team building activities do you go rock climbing together is there anything <laughs> anything that you're doing 
Well, today we went and made pasta together, so that was fun. That. <laughs> um, we do we do spend a lot of time together as a team. Um, so, for example, I'm in my apartment now in Brisbane and we're all living together um, and we will be for a few weeks. So we do spend a lot of time together. So off the bike, we actually almost forcibly spend time apart so that we're not like in each other's faces all the time because like sometimes it can get um get much when you know because we're each other's best friends right like especially the women's team we're like sisters we we know everything about each other so um we I'd say that in Adelaide we will go out and just do yeah just do basic stuff together we'll go and get dinner together we'll like some of the girls do yoga together um like things like that we just hang out like best friends off the bike usually it's it's no different to how other chicks would would hang out together after after uni or after work yeah 100 percent. and uh how have you been balancing your uni with your with your training at the moment uh not particularly well (laughs) Um, no, uh, so I'm, it's not been too bad. Um, I, so I'm doing a double degree in law and science, which is a lot. Um, and that's something that I took up straight after school. So I went straight into that before I started the Australian team. And um, I've actually been doing it pretty much full time up until now. So I knew that going into the Olympics was going to be very intense with just the amount of hours that we'd be spending on the track. So I dropped it back to just one subject this semester. So I went from four to one. Um, And it's still, even just the one, I was coming back from training, just like, I don't even want to study. Um, So, but I finished it. I finished it. I had my exam on Friday, which was great. And now I can just completely relax going into Olympics, which is great. Amazing. And and law and science, they seem like two completely different fields and subjects. How have you decided to bring them together? Yeah, so um, they are very different and I I do get asked that a lot. Um, Pretty much I was always interested in the science area. So I study marine biology and ecology and I was picking my subjects after year 12, what I wanted to do in university. And I guess I did a few internships and stuff and I realised that there was all these scientists that had all this amazing research and everything and then they just couldn't implement it because I guess there's no policy or instruments that allows them to do that and so I started sort of looking into law and and I was actually looking at arts as well like something to do with science communication and I've I got really interested in sort of environmental law and international law and and a lot of policy and things like that so yeah I decided to enroll in law school and it's cool because they're two very separate degrees so I could actually go into straight law after this um, because I liked it a lot more than I expected I I really loved the law degree Um, and yeah they're two separate completely separate degrees but they do complement each other in that regard and most of my friends in the law school are doing a double degree of some sort but yeah most of them are doing like international relations or, or something or commerce or something like that. But there are actually, there's a lot of areas opening up in, in, in law and science together. Have you seen Seaspiracy? <laughs> no, I Here haven't, but I've been told to watch it. I've been told to. Oh, wow. <laughs> I can't believe that. Okay. Have, have a watch. I know. <laughs> I, I, I kind of just thought it would make me more upset and feisty about it. <laughs> That's, that was actually how I thought. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. That yeah. was how yeah, I thought. Like law of the Sea is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, those areas, it's, they're opening up and there's no one who can really do both, to be honest. So yeah. I guess I'm training for a job that doesn't yet exist or is starting to exist. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's create a good niche, yeah. Create a job, grab in the market. They call that the yeah. promotion strategy, yeah. <laughs> create, your, create, your, create your own market. That's, yeah. that's awesome, yeah. That would be interesting to know what you think because you, you saw that and you're like, I'm never eating tuna again. Well, look, I, yeah, <laughs> I took a break from canned fish and that kind of stuff because I'm like, oh, where does it come from? Let me look into this a bit more before I just dive yeah. into the cheapest thing at the shop that's meant to be good for you. So it's, it's yeah. one of those it's situations hard. that's hard to avoid. It's hard to avoid and hard to know what's true out there. So, Well, I went, mm-hmm. my partner and I last night, we made a Japanese-style um, soup and we had garlic prawns uh, that we made on the mm-hmm. side. Now, going through the supermarkets trying to find responsibly sourced prawns is extremely difficult and they are a lot more expensive than like you know the other brands out there um it's yeah 
it's a dog eat dog world in the seafood industry. And I don't really think that um, they highlight it all too well and they don't highlight it often enough. But definitely the sea spiracy was a little bit of an eye opener for, for most of the community, I feel. They didn't really understand what was happening. I also don't want to know what's happening. Like, I know it's bad. I know it's going to be ugly. That's Ignorance what I just don't want to look. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's hard to put it on the consumer as well. That's why you need the law to kind of go through and actually fix that so it's not up to every single individual person to have to go through that. 100%. And are you a guest? Are you a speaker? Do you do public speaking as well? I'm, I'm doing a little bit. I'm definitely trying to get into it. It's something that I've always been interested in. You know, a lot of my sporting idols growing up, like Glenn Beachley and Kerry Pothast and even Anna Mears, they were always really strong uh, public speakers and, and did things like that. So that's something I'm definitely interested in pursuing after sports. So I'm doing a little bit here and there while I'm an athlete. Um, obviously, I'm still quite early in my career, though, so um, still got a lot of time left. <laughs> yeah. Were you a, did you enjoy the oral presentations during school? Is that what sort of um, pushed you in the direction? Yeah, I was well? a massive, I was a massive nerd in school. I was horrendous. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so, wow. Because I sort of didn't mind the oral presentations only because I felt that I was marked easier as opposed to a written assignment, which I was really bad at. <laughs> so I think, yeah. Like, yeah, for some reason I started to enjoy it, even though even though it was uncomfortable. <laughs> Positive red bull. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah. So weird. You had your old PowerPoint up on the screen and just, yeah. like, clicking the animations as they go, like. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, for some reason, some reason I've, I've enjoyed it as well. And we were just chatting to someone, a boxer, and he was saying he's based on a – I saw a document the Australian um, Olympic team had sent him, which was challenge yourself to something new each month. Uh, and he decided okay. to decided to do reading a book in public. So he walked into some conference room or something. Oh, yeah. It was a crazy he story. Walked, he said that he walked straight through um, I think it was straight the through a building. Yeah. And walked into, into a room and just started to read a passage of a book. He sort of prefaced it, explained to the guys. And now so he's hijacking the meeting. Yeah, did it for five minutes. <laughs> Stumbled That's a little crazy. bit, but, but he goes after that. I feel like he could run through a wall. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's um, insane. Yeah, I can't say I've ever, uh, no, I've never gone completely able and started reading <laughs> things in public or singing in public or anything like that. But, you know. <laughs> oh, well. Um, what, what sort of training do you, or have you decided to take on any training for the public speaking, or are you just taking on new opportunities? Yeah. I'm pretty much just taking on opportunities as they come at the moment. I had a really good one at my university not too long ago at the women's on Women's International Women's Day, sorry, um, at a brunch. And, yeah, and I guess also just doing some stuff um, locally, you know, when, when school groups come into the track and doing some school visits and things like that, um, which, yeah, I'm, I have always been interested in doing because, that's one of my big motivations as well in, in sport is, is the young kids coming up. Um, just before I left, actually, I got this little note from a girl at the Adelaide Track League. She's 11 and she's just started cycling. And um, when I first went to my first Adelaide Track League, um, I guess I was a bit tired that day and I am one of the younger girls on the team and I've never won a world championship and I've never won this or that. And I, that's kind of, you know, as an athlete, you're always looking for the next big thing. Um, don't really think much of yourself. And I remember there was this girl at the top of the track and every time I went past, she would yell out to me like, go Maeve and, and stuff. And it was wow. really sweet. And so after the race, I went up and, and said hi to her and she was there with her dad and she actually started crying that she got Aww. to meet me. And it was so sweet. And I asked her if she'd ever been on a track bike and she hadn't, but she wanted to. So I said, okay, let's go out next week and do a track session. So wow. I took her out and she was so good. Like she was really? next level. And anyway, we've stayed in contact and she does a lot of riding now, which is great. And she gave me this little letter before I left to the Olympics saying like that she hopes she can be an Olympian one day too. And it was so Holy sweet. So like, things like that. Yeah, it was, it was so sweet. And so, Things like that make you, it, that's motivating because you yeah. look at what you do every day and you don't really see yourself as 
as being that to a kid like I was kind of like oh kids would look look up to me because I haven't won this or I haven't won that like there's better athletes um but they don't care they like they um yeah they they don't mind like no matter what level you are yeah that's brilliant that's really cool and and do you want to take I guess that a little bit more seriously the advocating for young young female cyclists are you going to try to jump into the I guess the spotlight and speak more about that and get more attention at least here in Australia not I guess internationally yeah yeah definitely and it's about encouraging young girls to do it and say like yeah you can do this and and another thing is you can do it while studying and while pursuing other careers I think that's probably more relevant for the older girls so like 18 19 because we do have a really large dropout in our sport at around that age when girls are finishing school and they're going on to do other things they feel like they can't do cycling and and um and their studies at the same time and and that's not just cycling sorry that's a lot of sports to be honest there is a large dropout rate around that age so trying to I guess smooth that out is definitely a goal of mine that's that's I still love that story that's phenomenal such a such an awesome thing as well good on you for for taking it out and and showing her and taking on a road bike being the role model yeah that she needs and wants yeah it's fantastic that's... she was she was great she's a lovely girl <laughs> you should it, 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 if you get into an interview after you win your gold medal you would definitely shout her out i reckon she'll be watching oh. you would you would you'd <laughs> literally be paving the way for future olympians she probably following your uh. footsteps <laughs> Yeah. Oh, to be honest, with her age, like if I'm still riding by 2032, she could be my medicine <laughs> partner. <laughs> That's what I said to her. Wow. <laughs> she could be awesome. my teammate, realistically. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you feel there's a pressure on you as well, though, if you are being looked up in in that light? Um, or, or do you I just embrace that think fully? So. I, I don't think so because I actually don't think these – uh, I was actually speaking to the, my teammate Nettie Edmondson about this the other day. Um, I actually don't feel like the the young fans really mind if you win or lose. Like they are looking up to you as a person, not necessarily your results. Obviously, you can build a bigger fan base if you have better results. But you know, um, for example, Nettie, my teammate, like I looked up to her for years and years and years before I actually got to ride on a team with her, and. Um, and th- th- that never crossed my mind, like whether she won gold or silver or anything. I just looked up to her. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's yeah. awesome, man. I don't know. Kids are great. Kids are great. I'm just, I, I don't know what it is. They, they have this weird, they have, they have an ignorance that is admirable. Like they walk up to you and they don't care who you are. They're just like, wow, you've never really like in the grand scheme of things won medals or anything like that but you are my role model and like it's just it's cool like you can't but help be be in awe of that sort of yeah. mindset and that acknowledgement it's like wow that's humbling yeah yeah okay. yeah and you know what like i even saw it with um one writer who i've always looked up to definitely in her advocacy for women in sport is um caroline buchanan the bmx star. and just the comments that i saw when she missed out on Olympic selection this time around. It was like the comments on her Twitter and Instagram and stuff like, hey, you might have missed out, but my six-year-old daughter still thinks you're freaking amazing. Wow. So, like, keep going you. And, like, I see that as, yeah, that's the legacy you want to create, you know? 100%. Is that is that something you've thought a lot about, the legacy you want to create? Um, not so much yet, but I think moving forward, definitely. You know, I think making making the first olympic team has definitely made me think about those things because it um i guess you, you become a little bit more in the spotlight and things like that but it is funny because you you don't really even when you've achieved stuff you never look back at like what you've achieved you just kind of are like oh but i won't be a really good athlete until i've won this or done this or something 100%, yeah <laughs> definitely um and I'm very yeah. sorry about the darkness, by the way, but I figure we could <laughs> can just right. be like the voice now. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. It's getting dark. Um, when do you when do you head to Tokyo? Um, 24th of July. Oh, so wow. very close right to before. our event. We yeah, right before. Um, it's pretty much an Olympics. Like we have not seen an Olympics before. Usually we'd be there quite a bit before testing out the track, getting acclimatized. 
and then you'd stay thereafter, I believe, to like have fun and party. But that's <laughs> not going to be this at oh. all. <laughs> we get there. We um, we've actually got an entire hotel booked just for our team, so we're not actually going to stay in the village at all, which is good for a COVID perspective because if you get COVID, you're not on the start line. Um, yes. It's that. Yeah. So we will be in a hotel. I don't even think we can leave our rooms to like eat. I think we're going to have our rooms, our food delivered to our rooms. And, um, and we get COVID tested every day. And then within 48 hours of finishing our race, we have to be back on the plane to Australia. <laughs> wow. Wow. So yeah, not much time two-week for quarantine. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so my groom in quarantine, like, woo. Wow. So on your Instagram, you've, you put up a heap of photos about your travels and you exploring the world. Have you been to Japan before? And if you haven't, then what are you going to go back? Because obviously you can't st- stick around to experience it. Yeah, I've never been to Japan and um, I really was keen to go explore before this whole uh, COVID thing. I guess I will have to go back. (laughs) Um, I don't know if there's a whole lot of, I know there's not a whole lot of road races there, but I think there's a few track events. So hopefully in the future, I'll be able to go back for that. There's a A lot of my travels. Oh, sorry, you continue. So yeah, a lot of uh, my travels are, more so go to the place that we're racing, see the velodrome and see my hotel. <laughs> so I hope I can go to, the, to Japan and actually explore. Yeah, there's a, there's a massive bike touring scene in Japan. Um, it, there's brilliant sightseeing to be had. Uh, it's one of the places I want to go to ride. I've been there to uh, walk around and explore, do you know, the street Mario Kart racing. But, yeah, the cycling scene over there is fantastic. <laughs> Yes, yes. And they love track cycling. So um, yeah. the velodrome, I think, will, if it's, an, if it's a Japanese crowd, I'm not worried about there not being a crowd because they love track. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. And when you come back to Australia, two-week quarantine, is there then a celebration, uh, a partying that you'll, that you'll have? Yeah, you'll, it's you'll like, oh, gold medal. Yeah. Yeah, woo, delayed. Um, um, yeah. Well, I hope if we do well, I can. I'm, I'm just. I think I'm just going to be so excited to get out of quarantine. To be honest. Um, so if yeah. I win, I hopefully, hopefully, I can have a bit of a celebration. Um, yeah. but I'm actually gonna. Um, I'm gonna try and go to the World Championships in September? October. Yeah. After after that, so I want to try and hold on to my form. And to be honest, like. I'm not a huge party person, not going to lie. So it'll probably be like me, like one night, and then I'll be like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> That's yeah. my socialising for the year. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that makes it Me done makes, for the whole year. <laughs> makes it easy to hold um, on. I'm actually... Yeah, no, and I'm thinking I, I might try and actually I'm, I'm really lacking Brisbane, so I'm thinking I might even try to come back to Brisbane or Gold Coast or something like that and do a bit of training here in the warm because I don't really want to be training in the middle of winter in Adelaide there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how you're talking about how you're unfortunately missing out on your elevation training? Well, if you're at the Gold Coast, you've got the Lamington National Park there and that that's brilliant training. There's a lot of people. What was that, got- sorry? Um, if you were to come back up to Queensland, um, you were saying that you were missing out on the elevation training. Well, the Lam- at the Gold Coast, there's the Lamington National Park that's very close, and there is excellent elevation training to be had there. A lot of people I know who go on, um, on group rides, they ride from Brisbane to Lamington National Park. It, it's fantastic. Oh. That's cool. Okay. I'm actually, I think I've got a little bit of a break in the next few days in a few days off of the track so I get five days off the track to reset and I was thinking I'd, I'd spend some time on the Goldie so I, maybe I'll ride there and someone yeah. else can bring my bag there <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you took there's a you can take a train down nice and easy catch a train down uh, and then from Gold Coast the train station there you can go out to Lamington National Park it's brilliant really do recommend it cool if, nice. if you're listening right now we're giving away a $20 gift card to the first listener to DM our Instagram at Outspoken Show Maeve is amazing and make sure you come back to the program to hear what's next. I should have done it earlier. I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I just got caught up. I've got to watch to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. The poor, the poor listeners are like, going to have to be that far in. No, <laughs> like, well, they're like, where's, where's my promo code? Where's my promo code? Yeah, 
Oh, well. but um, oh goodness. <laughs> when when we were we were speaking to a swimmer from the Gold Coast, like, and he, we were a bit nervous about bringing him in on at, at our place to do the show just because we were a bit scared of COVID. And all even that, even yeah. though we're healthy, but if someone else in the area was was a bit sick, um, so you're like, ah, Gold Coast. Let's let's go explore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully. That being said, there's a few cases popping up in and around yeah. places. I was actually supposed to have my family down from Adelaide. Um, I wanted to see them before I left for Tokyo, um, but they shut the border just before I got on the phone to you guys um, to South Australia. Really? So, well, oh, sorry, well, South wow. Australia shut it to Queensland, um, oh, which is unfortunate. So, yeah, that spoils my plans a little bit. So I'll have to work out what to do now. But um, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, there's a, th- a little bit popping up. So we, we're being really cautious in the two weeks before we leave to Tokyo. We're pretty much going to bubble. Um, yeah. It'll just be us staying in in a hotel near the track and um, not really seeing anyone. <laughs> yeah. Are there many things that you've been doing just to take your mind off of training while you've been in this bubble? Um, I've mostly been doing my study, to be honest. Yeah. That's took, taken up a lot of my time. Um, I've definitely found going into Olympics has been a lot more media and things like that than I'm used to. Um, but most of the time we're actually are at the track for such long days at the moment that, you know, you get to the track at eight and we're getting back at six. So that's a long day. <laughs> yeah. You get home and you don't want to do much. <laughs> yeah. How have you, have you found the, the media, the press and the sort of, have you enjoyed it? Or, you seem like a fairly active person. I'm just putting on a light. Yeah, right. um sorry I'm, I, I'm sorry it's got really dark here oh, yeah <laughs> i'm just trying to balance something up it's crazy i could that's go back right. inside oh no that's not gonna work that's um right. okay <laughs> um i look i do i don't mind the media stuff i don't mind it at all it's something that i've always wanted to get good at i'm still learning obviously i hear myself back on recordings and stuff and think i talk too fast and etc <laughs> but um no i haven't been minding it and especially when, you know, sport is your job, your entertainment. I think that's a really big part of it. And I think sometimes athletes do forget that. And in my sport particularly, we don't have a super high profile. So I like to think I'm doing my part and bringing it up and bringing it to as many people outside of cycling as possible. That's a big goal of mine. Um, You know, doing interviews and things like that with uh, news outlets that aren't cycling related <laughs> yeah um so that people from other sports can learn about it as well oh, I'm sorry. that's one thing that we've spoken about a lot is that athletes are entertainers more than more yep. than anything really because you've got to yep. get people wanting to watch is there anyone that you that you look to in terms of the athlete entertainer that you sort of go oh actually i like the way she or he presents themselves or, or hypes an event up that you sort of take little tidbits from? Um, well, one that I was saying before was that Caroline Buchanan. I think I've been mm. following her for years before I even started cycling because she did it so well. Like BMX women's wasn't even on the agenda for lots of people and now you see her on like Nutrigrain and things like that. Um, I saw um, that Charlotte, uh, I've forgotten her last name, Kaisak or something from... Um, from rugby I think she did it quite well with rugby after they won gold in Rio as well um you know she apparently the, the women's actually sevens team after Rio got it was something like a 50 percent increase in women's participation after that medal that they won so I think they wow. all railed that really well as well you know um yeah people like that who who do put in the time and effort and 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 make their their sports known whether a lot of them do it via social media um but then also just from interviews and and news outlets and other things like that yeah have you delved into the tiktok side of social media (laughs) to to try and promote cycling as well (laughs) not yet i have a tiktok but it's got about five followers and i don't really use it um i i was born in 99 so i think I'm going to say that's like, we're going to round it up to 2000s and that means I'm allowed to have a TikTok. <laughs> I've got to. one. I've got one and I'm the same year. So, <laughs> okay, so, we're allowed. Bye-bye. We're allowed. Yeah. We're allowed. Yeah. All my yeah. teammates are like, don't you, all my teammates are a lot older than me and they're like, don't you dare. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not a millennial. What's the one after millennial? Is it Gen? Uh, Gen I don't know. Z. I don't know. Gen, Gen Z. Gen Z. Yeah. Gen Z. 
I don't know. I'm the one after that. So I'm like, I'm allowed to have a TikTok <laughs> if I want to. So maybe 100%. after the Olympics, we'll do a TikTok. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do a TikTok because the it's sort of just insane the amount yeah, of organic right. reach. Because I, I was saying, explaining it to a yeah. boxer, trying to encourage him to get on TikTok because I posted a TikTok, and it's sort of annoying because it's, it's this, stupid. <laughs> yeah, the the worst TikTok that I've done got three point six million. And and the best, oh, wow. get, yeah, it, it was just annoying that the bad ones have done so well. And the, the good and ones the, have done, yeah, they, they do okay. But it's just like, <laughs> how do I? How does it? This doesn't make sense anymore. But uh, but just oh, the, it doesn't make. Reaching, but that being said, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it doesn't make sense. The stuff you watch on TikTok is it? <laughs> you do get you go on it, you watch some random 100%. stuff. Yeah, but that is the thing. It, like stuff like Instagram and Facebook now, it's it's impossible to to get to reach people. It's so hard. They they put you at the bottom of the feeds and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I should do a TikTok. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> annoying because you make a post and and you might reach thirty percent of your following, and it's like god damn, like just. Yeah, it, it's annoying because you know you've got X amount of followers, but then it's just not getting displayed to enough people, and and I guess yeah. that's just the oversupply of content on the platform. And I think TikTok, because it's still young as a platform, has been able to provide good reach to yeah, good incredible. reach to people. So um, yeah, and it's definitely. Yeah, and I definitely think things like Instagram are pretty hard to find new people to follow now as well. Um, yeah. And, you know, as an athlete, it's hard to reach new people on it, um, definitely to gain followers and gain reach because unless you want to pay for ads or something, then you're probably not going to get them. Yeah. And I'm not doing that. So, <laughs> um, But it's, it's getting better. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I mean, just by performing is yep. a great way to grow as well like just showing up and, and excelling is is also one of the best ways to grow yeah so. hell if you win a gold everyone will know who you yeah. are <laughs> hopefully well maybe it's, it's been great to talk to you and uh we've learned a lot and and yeah it's been really good talking to you mm-hmm. if people listening and they want to follow you follow your journey is it instagram the best way to follow along yeah, probably. That's that's my most used platform platform well, at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> what's your um, what's your handle? Is it is it Maeve? What happened? Just my Maeve. name, Maeve Pluth, yeah. Maeve Pluth, so well. Maeve Pluth. Um that's well, good. <laughs> well thanks for coming on to the show, Maeve. It's been great to talk to you and uh, and good luck in good luck in Tokyo. Thank you so much, guys. I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> good luck. Good luck, mate. <laughs>